Welcome to Goonies World. I am Goonie, also known as Colin. And joining me, as always, are Johnny Favreau, also known as Sean. Hello there, everyone. And Meanie, also known as Ryan. How do you do, old boy? I do fine, thank you. And we are playing a game called Space 1889. Yes, that's right. And I got this game in 1989 at Hobby Haven in Independence, Missouri. And in all that time, I've never really played a game of this. I don't know if I just never really tried to sell it to a group or whether I stole so much of its influence from my own worlds, you know. Uh, but I'm finally getting a chance to run it, which is fun. And we're running uh, the original, you know, Frank Chadwick edition. And, uh,. We're using the adventure that's in the book, so if you've already uh, know about this adventure, you can see how we twist and change it. And if you have missed it somehow since 1989, spoiler alert. Anyway, but first of all, before we get too deep into the game, uh, really what excited me about it a lot was the character ideas these guys came up with. So I'm going to let uh, them tell you about their characters first. I uh, will jump right in with Ryan. Tell us all about Archibald Riley. Very well. He's a. Uh, uh, I'm trying. I'm trying to do sort of a uh, the poshest British accent I can pull off, but I, I am not particularly good at it. So. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, we'll assume it's all the time he spent in foreign cultures. It's it's twisted his accent a bit. Yes, of course, because he's um. A British doctor named Archibald Riley, and he's got a, a nice slicked back sort of haircut and very large bulbous mutton chops. Um, and um, of course, he's always wearing a suit. He wears a nice bow tie as well. Um, and uh, f fairly tall, uh, you know, skinny uh, or fit, as as, as they say. Um, but uh, he's uh, quite. Uh, Fascinated with all of the uh, latest and greatest in medicine, medicine, I think they would say, um, such as you know all the bloodletting and, and, and whatnot. And um, he's quite famous, in fact, um, for having discovered, uh, you know, a, a, some uh, undiscovered tribe in Africa uh, in his younger days. All right, and let's scoot over to Goonie. Tell us about, is it Hen Henrietta? Was that it? Henrietta yes. Honey? All right, Lady <clears throat> Henrietta Honey. Yes, um, Mrs. Henrietta Honey. Um, she is a lady detective, and uh, she actually, her husband... The famed Lord Honey was a detective, and he was murdered, and she solved his murder, which made her famous, and she's been continuing to solve cases, solve crime, and uh, has made, you know, a name for herself, and is also kind of famous, um, and she's not taken seriously by some people but uh, she is her clients are happy with her work and she does good work uh, according to other detectives I think well uh, we're just going to start with the both of you at a train station in the Arizona Territory. You've traveled a very, very long way to meet with a gentleman named Cyrus Grant. He's a inventor, thought of as a bit of a crackpot, but uh, his money is good. And he has uh, talked both of you into coming out here and joining him in an expedition to Luna, the moon. And this is preposterous in some circles because the moon is generally thought of as being worthless there's been a few expeditions that have gone there now in the world of space 1889 mars is colonized and so is venus and even parts of mercury 
Uh, it's very much like the European powers were carving up Africa in real life. They're just doing it uh, out there in space. And that's because Thomas Edison invented uh, uh, an ether propeller that would actually take ships through the luminiferous ether, which, as we all know, fills space. But the moon has been bypassed because uh, the methods that people use to fly and land and achieve orbit from and to other planets is either hydrogen bags or something called liftwood, which was discovered on Mars, which uh, is lighter than gravity and floats. But those both work also in conjunction with an atmosphere, and there is no atmosphere on the moon. And an ether propeller would be the only thing you could steer with and uh, navigate with, and that is measured in like millions of miles per day. So no one's ever had the precision to really investigate the moon and land on it. But until recently, some people have started, and the Russians have gone several times, you know of. But, uh, you know, no one knows much about what, uh, what that wacky czar and his ministers are getting up to. But, uh, so, but they haven't been there in a couple of years. You guys, I assume, would have read into this a little bit, you know, the history of the moon. A guy named uh, Vladimir Tereshkova went there uh, five times, they say, for the czar. And uh, the last time he went there, he never came back. And so there's just no real incentive for a lot of lunar exploration, not when there are such obscene fortunes to be made on Mars and Venus. But you're at a train station just outside of Tombstone, Arizona. And you're waiting for Dr. Grant. And you have some time to talk as you sit there and look out over the beautiful countryside. And I'm picturing some green grass because I've been to, to, uh, to Tombstone and it was greener than I thought. And maybe that's why they put a town there. <laughs> but uh, it, other than that, there's the, the wind and the distant bustle of people moving about in Tombstone, the occasional gunshot, because it's known to be a fairly wild place. But you guys have some time to chat, uh, so Dr. Grant will, of course, be picking you up here at the train station. So you have some time to uh, get to know each other a little bit. I assume we uh, arrived and, um, like, separately we didn't necessarily, like, travel together. Yeah, you became aware of each other's presence on uh, on this last leg of the rail journey, and because uh, there's there's no uh, there's no zeppelin that'll come out here. Uh, they go straight to California, and they don't meander this far south. So your last leg had to be on train. But you guys have traveled separately so far. You may your eye may have noticed this lovely young lady on the train. Uh, possibly overheard her accent and. Uh, gives you guys you're both british citizens in tombstone arizona in 1889 that's a good as good an opening for conversation as any i suppose i say you do see you seem as though you've got a some sort of uh, you're not from around here either it seems no i am not i have never been to america until now it's quite strange so hot, isn't it? Oh, dreadful. It's dry and hot, and I'm uh, looking over my shoulder for savages. Yes, I suppose that that is a da- one of the many dangers of the great expanse out here. But I do wonder. I mean, surely you must be uh, must be here for the uh, lunar expedition, yes? Yes, and I figured as much as with you as well. Yes, you yes. are quite famous. I've seen your picture in the newspaper. Yes, yes. Uh, Archibald Riley's the name. Yes, Mrs. Henrietta Honey. Henrietta Honey. Oh, my, didn't you solve your husband's murder or something? I think I've read about that. Yes, I did. Grizzly. Oh, very good. Did you have a man helping you? <laughs> no, and I get asked that question quite a lot. Absolutely not. I used my reasoning and deduction skills, which my husband did somewhat help me with, but he was not um, 
fond of teaching me because of the uh, stigma, but I watched and listened and I picked up his skills and, and I still continue to use them. Well, that's and very I suppose, impressive. Yes, I suppose that's why I was called to for this mission. So your husband was, was an investigator, you say? Yes, he was. Interesting. So you must have... I mean, you say he was reluctant to sort of teach you, but you must have picked up some, some of his training or something, or perhaps you're just naturally gifted in a way. A little both, I think. I did uh, pay attention when he was working cases. I, I paid attention to his methods when I learned a thing or two and I like to think that I am uh, quite intuitive as well well now I understand that the, the moon uh, could be quite dangerous you see I suppose so I don't really know what to expect on the moon doesn't look like much just a bunch of craters I I do suspect that maybe this is some sort of publicity stunt to um, sell from this uh, American to sell his new propeller. You know, he's got two famous people, and he's. It, it will certainly make headlines. Oh, yes, yes, that's quite intuitive of you. I hadn't occurred to me. I thought surely he just had some. You know business on the moon to attend to or you know it's just the unknown really since nobody's really sort of explored it much or paid much attention to it you know but, but everybody seems to think that it's just worthless well it certainly looks worthless through a telescope but I suppose um, one has to go there directly and you know if there's if there's some sort of living beings on the moon I suppose they would be underground uh, I'm, I'm sorry I, I'm sorry says the voice I couldn't help but overhear your conversation excuse me and uh, uh, a dude walks up he's dressed in nice clothes like you guys but uh, a little worse for the wear a uh, little mustache he's got himself a little notebook hi there I'm with the uh, I'm with the the Tombstone Chronicle here, and I just, I can't help but overhear you. You talking about, uh, Moon Men? I'm sorry there. Uh... I was only speculating. Um, I don't, so I don't really think we'll find any sort of Moon Men. Okay, so it's true that Cyrus Grant, he's, he's going to the moon, huh? Well, he's sending us anyway. I don't think he's going himself. Well, I, I tell you, no, it doesn't surprise me. Uh, I, I, I didn't ever took him very seriously on all that. You know, the man's crazy. You're gonna die up there. I'm just telling you. That ether propeller, Governor, he told, that's gonna smash right into the side of the moon, and uh, you're gonna die up there. I, I'm telling you, don't go. Well, they certainly have a way here in America of getting right to the point. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. That's what makes us the greatest country in the world. In this one, anyway, because America doesn't have a lot of colonies on Mars. Or, uh, you know. Yes, it's all British expansion. What makes you so certain of this, my good man? Well, the man's. The man's. Have you met him? Not yet, but we've corresponded quite regularly in our negotiations. Well, he's got himself a warehouse sort of workshop and an observatory uh, a few miles from here. Uh, and, uh,. He, let me just tell you, the, the fellow's got a bit of a reputation, uh, a little bit eccentric, uh, a little bit prone to drink. You know, uh, he's he's been laughed out of uh, all the you know the scientific establishment. Now I'm just passing on hearsay mostly. I'll be honest, but uh, I've tried. I've talked to him on two or three occasions, and I found him. Uh, I think he's out of his mind. You know, he. Uh, so, so I, I I've just uh, given you a good fair warning. I hope you're making a great deal of money. But if anyone took this seriously, don't you think that I wouldn't be the only press man standing around out here? Well, I was wondering where everyone was. But, um, I suppose, uh, your word of caution is, uh, duly noted. All right, all right. 
What, what about you, Sideburns? Well, uh, I suppose I will have to make a judgment on my participation in this adventure based upon my impressions of the man himself. Oh, man himself, yeah. Well, uh, at any rate, uh, how about a quick quote for the for the Chronicle? Uh, well, what do you think you're going to find up there on the moon? But before you can answer, there's an odd-sounding horn that uh, rings out, and you look around, you realize you look up because <laughs> there's what looks like a flying rowboat descending on you. It's got some sails coming out of the side. And looking over the side of it, uh, down at you and waving is a bespectacled man, tall, balding, with a fringe of wild red hair. Huge guy, though. Like six foot eight. Probably weighs like 300 some odd pounds. He's gigantic. And he's waving at you while he's maneuvering this, uh, this, this ether craft. It's not an ether craft, it's a liftwood craft. Uh, of course, you've seen these things before. But he's maneuvering it down and uh, hello there, hello there, Dr. Cyrus Grant, how are you? How the hell are you? Well, let me get on down, here, here, get, and he gets to where he's not fully landed yet. Uh, how you doing, Tompkins, he says with a sour look at the newspaper man. And, uh, there, little lady, let me give you a hand there. Let me give you a hand there, sweetheart. Why aren't you just as pretty as a tick on a hound dog? Get on up here. I'm sorry, am I too... Go in this vehicle with you, and where yes. are we headed? Oh, we're going to head back. <laughs> well, you know where we're headed, but first of all, we got to get back and uh, get to the lab, and uh, we'll talk about things a little bit. But uh, get on here. Don't talk to that newspaper man, you know. He's, uh... All right, come on up. Come on up. All right. There you go. Give me that pretty little hand there, sweetheart. All right, all right. You get on in here. Not a lot of room up here. Excuse me. Mind the mess, and he's uh, brushes some old packages and wrappers and things out of the way around the seats and the... Well, hello there, Mr. Riley. Come on up. Come on up. Look. Come on up, Mr. Riley. Make yourself comfortable. Yes, of course. Go of course. and take a sit there. Are you, 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 are you a flying man, Mr. Riley? Um, no. Ah, feel free to take the tiller here. There's nothing to it. We're going to bring her up. We're going to bring her up a little bit. There we go. And, uh, let me release some gas here. All right. Should be a real quick trip. Well, we're going to get out of the grasslands here. You're going to see some, uh, some beautiful desert. Beautiful desert. I prefer it myself. I prefer it myself. And, uh, well, I'm so glad you came. And, uh, you, you know, I've been laughed out of every respectable damn explorer society on this planet. And a couple of others, too. And I'll tell you what, I've been glad to have some people of your notoriety and repute to come with me. Your, uh, your testimony on all this is going to prove everything worthwhile. We're going to make millions. You know, there's riches in diamonds up there. All kinds of them. You like um, diamonds? You like diamonds? Uh, may, I, may I call you Henry? You may call me Mrs. Honey, thank you. Well, uh, yeah, touche, touche, Mrs. Honey, Mrs. Honey. Yes, uh... I, I will say I do have some concerns. Concerns? Some deep concerns, yes. Oh, well, ain't nothing to be concerned about. Well, I say when we get to the, um, your lab, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. maybe you can, uh... Soothe me and 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 talk me into how you think this is all going to play out. Well, well, I'll certainly give you my best impression. Okay, I, but I'll tell you this: uh, uh, I will tell you that uh, funding your uh, detective agency for the next several years may uh, may convince you, if nothing else does. Well, well, how about you, Mr. Riley? You have any second thoughts? You've been talking to that Tompkins, that pesky newspaper man. Yes, some, I'm afraid. He, he seems to think that, um, that this uh, expedition is not going to go particularly well. Um, I don't know if I believe him, but, I mean, you do seem rather jovial and vivacious, oh. and you don't seem intoxicated or drunk at all to me. Not right now. All right, no, no. The man saw me drunk once or twice. The man's allowed to have a drink. This is America. Hell, I believe a man's allowed to have a drink even in England. Yes, mostly tea. Ah, right, well, well, ain't got no tea here, but I have the finest coffee this side of the Mississippi. I'm ready to serve you. Yeah, I got a great native boy who makes it. He's uh, kind of a good houseboy. Anyway, oh, there she is. Look out there. And uh, you're 
you're leaving the grasslands that are right around Tombstone and heading out into uh, what can only be called desert. It's beautiful country. Beautiful. Of course, it is hot, even up this high. And, of course, the sun beats down. But there's a hill not too far away, and there's a domed observatory on it. And there's at the bottom of the hill, there's you know, basically a barn. <laughs> a great big barn. It's all been whitewashed. And the observatory is whitewashed as well. Oh, here we go. Here we go. And he takes it down, and a young native boy runs out and uh, grabs a rope that he's dropping from the Liftwood Flyer. And the boy ties it off, and he hops out. Come on in. Come on in. We'll, uh, we'll talk about it all right here. You got that coffee made up, don't you? All right, thanks. All right, here, let me help you down there, little lady. Okay. Well, and he opens the barn door with a flourish, and inside you see this great big thing. It looks like a bullet. He's like a, he looks like nothing so much as a bullet with little portholes in it. It's laying on its side, and it's on like a cart with wheels, but the, the, that's not part of it. It's just laying on the cart. Well, there she is. There she is. And uh, come around back. I'll show you this ether propeller governor. And in the back of it, there is at the you know the flat part of the bullet shape. He proudly points to, as if it should solve all your doubts and concerns. Uh, so it looks like a, a funnel at the end of which is a diamond, a very big diamond, a huge diamond, in fact, the biggest you've ever seen in real life. And uh, now, now, don't get too excited about that diamond's value. It's actually quite flawed. It's almost useless as jewelry, but it's perfect for focusing the ether onto this here ether propeller. And there's a massive propeller at the open end of the funnel. With this, I can achieve such absolute precision that there will be a perfectly safe trip. Uh, it's not doesn't do too good in atmosphere, but that's why we take her up in a bag until the bag pops. Then we kick this on and straight to the moon. Should only take about six hours. Hell, we could be back by tea time tomorrow. Yes, I don't know. I'm assuming that um, no one else has... Uh attempted this before I mean with your vehicle not with this vehicle not with this vehicle no that's why there's been so many terrible crash landings up there why uh, Vladimir T- uh, Teleshnikov he's the only one who really done it and he didn't do it the last time and no one's quite sure how he did it exactly he may have something like this but I doubt it I put my whole fortune into this uh, but it ain't just that no uh, there's a reason to go up there and uh something I want to show you folks and in the back of the room there's a chalkboard and uh, a bulletin board next to that and he's got equations all over the chalkboard but on the bulletin board there's some uh, now these are some uh, recently developed daguerreotypes they were taken by a ship en route to Mars from the dark side of the moon now look here look here and he points there's this tiny little pinprick of white spot what might be light now, this is something that uh, ether farers have talked about for a long time. This thing they call the glow on the dark side of the moon. Now, what I say we do, we get there, this is what we explore. And I've done spectrographs of this. There's diamonds there. Diamonds galore. It will fund research for decades to come. And possibly more. So, we get up there, we're the first ones in. You see what I'm saying? I mean, man's got to be a pragmatist. No, oh, I see. Yes, that's right. That's how so, we. That's how science gets paid for with industry and, and commerce. Yes, I. So you think this, this glow, is like the gleam of diamonds, could reflecting? Be. Could be. Could be many things. Could be many things. There's definitely diamonds there in the signature. Also, a great deal of fungi. Of course, I took my I took my findings to the Royal Geographic Society, and they laughed at me. Took them to the took to the American the National Geographic Society. They laughed at me. Well, you know what? I can relate to that. I've had some difficulties uh, being, you know, as a woman detective. I've gotten quite a lot of uh, pushback and mockery coming my way well well I tell you that's one of the reasons why I I, uh, I, I was interested in your story because I also have had plenty of that uh, in my life and of course Mr. Riley I was very very 
I read with great interest your monograph on the Kwanda people that you published some years ago, and I was very impressed with the way you, uh, well, well, well can, you, can you tell me a little bit more about them Kwanda people? What would you like to know? Well, I'd like to know how you established uh, communications with them. Was it very difficult to learn the language? Well, it, it did take quite a long time before I could sp- speak and communicate with them uh, outside of, outside of you know, making gestures and, uh, yeah, and yeah. crude sort of... Um, but actually, their language is quite advanced and quite a bit more um, complicated than you might think, um, having been sort of... Um, Developed over these centuries in utter isolation, you know. Well, well, that's one of the reasons exactly why you're here. Because I don't see any reason to believe that there is fungus on the moon. There could not be intelligent life. And with your track record of uh, dealing with these isolated peoples, uh, I think that uh, you would be just the man for the job. There also could be a great, great deal of travel involved. If something should happen to this Ethan Flyer, you know, it's good to have a man who's uh, trained in wilderness survival of various kinds. Of course, there being no air on the moon, I do have these lovely suits for us. Come on into the interior here. And he opens a hatch in the side of the uh, Ether Flyer. And uh, there are two, there are three actually smart looking vacuum suits here. And they look more like, you know, old school diving, you know, the big, uh, huge bronze sort of uh, helmets and uh, we'll need these on the actual surface of the moon but uh, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it now uh, listen uh, after we have that coffee uh, I say we uh, I say we could get some sleep but you know I'm, I'm starting to get so excited that maybe, maybe you just freshen up for a bit and I, I say what did you say we just uh, take roll this out there get that gas bag going and uh, go to the moon what do you say Well, I do have, I still feel like I have um, a little reservation. Well, let me tell you, you should rise to the challenge because in some ways this is a very fascinating missing persons case. After all, when Teleshnikov went there, you know, I probably said his name about four different ways, but his name is uh, Tereshkova. I just need to remember that. I'm real bad with these Russian names. Tereshkova. All right, now Tereshkova, he was there several times. Last time he was there, 1887, never came back. So it's a two years cold missing persons case. And, uh, yes. That, that uh, ought to excite your professional. You are correct. Uh, I think uh, it would be a, a great case to solve if we could uh, find out what happened to this uh Missing Russian. He'd be the first person to solve a crime on the moon. And they would certainly have to take me seriously then. So, I'm quite curious, though, of course. Now, as you mentioned, and as is quite obvious, there is no air on the moon. So I don't suppose, then, that it would be possible for someone to survive there for two years. Well, that's the real mystery now, isn't it? Because some people theorize, and I don't want to lead to any conclusions, that the moon may be unique in local planetary bodies in that uh, when it, as it was solidifying, it had huge gaseous bubbles inside of it, yes, which could have created very large pockets that would enable, obviously there must be some rudimentary atmosphere there if the fungi can survive. And so I believe possibly there may be subterranean cavities on the moon that could harbor life. Very maybe not life as we know it. But I'm sure that they'd be interested in maybe building a factory or welcoming a missionary enterprise or some such thing. <laughs> yes, well, I certainly think my curiosity has been piqued. Well, then. <laughs> Oh, yes, go ahead, sir. Go ahead, uh, Dr. Riley. I was only going to say that should there be any dangers or should we run across any uh, challenges uh, 
I, I, I believe I should be able to protect you. He's well, that's... I just wanted to be condescending, that's all. <laughs> well, I may need you to protect me, too. Despite my girth and height, I am no fighter. And also, I wear spectacles. Yes, I was noticing that you looked like you could be a rugby player. Oh, uh, well, well, I don't know rugby, but, uh... No, I don't know from rugby, but I, 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 uh, I wrestled a few, uh, a few cows in my youth, a few calves, but never took to it. I was always a little smarter than the other fellows around me. Uh, but that's my life story, and you don't need to hear that. Or maybe you do, but if you do, we got six hours where I can tell it. So what would you say? Would you do you want to have a bite and freshen up, or would you rather just jump on this, jump on this old girl and go to the moon? Have well, I assuaged I'd... all your fears and concerns? I wouldn't say they're completely assuaged, but I, I'm confident enough in our abilities to, to succeed that I think I'm ready to go. I did have a rather nice meal aboard the train, um, and I'm not currently hungry, although, Mrs. Honey, if you would like to uh, have a meal or, or freshen up a bit, I, I certainly wouldn't mind waiting. I shall freshen up. I think I also am quite full from the meal but um, I think I will freshen up and then we can be on our way absolutely absolutely I'll, I'll let me show you to the facilities you may not find them as very high style but I'm sure they will suffice and he shows you where a washroom in the back is and uh, here help me help me help me uh, dr. Riley uh, load on some of these uh, some of these crates here just in case yeah, it's a cool one. Yeah, we got some good food stuffs here. I got plenty of potable water. And, uh, of course, we do have an emergency. Uh, two days worth of oxygen here. Patting a huge tank towards the back of the crowd. And, uh, oh, and did you want to do something while you're gone, or are you just literally freshening up? Um, well, I figured that she probably was wearing, like, a corset, um, just proper Victorian. Oh, yeah stuff so she would probably like to change into uh that uh, bicycle her, her suit bicycle thing. suit yeah <laughs> yeah it's uh so it's more practical more practical it's part of the dress reform movement that's going on right now in england yes uh, which is uh advocating it's a woman can still be stylish and feminine while having more room for movement and not such restrictive ridiculous clothing and so when uh when Henrietta Honey does come back out, she's wearing a smart bicycle suit, which has like little knicker pants, and uh, but still looks kind of dress-like on the top. And uh, I can actually breathe now that I'm not wearing a corset. Yes. Uh, I'm going to need all my lung use, I think, in this uh, these big metal suits. Absolutely, yeah, but, but don't worry, we don't have to put those on until we get there. Oh, I'm sorry, are you coming along, then? Oh, me? Oh, he he hell yes, I wouldn't miss it for the world. Who's going to fly this thing if not me? Oh, I see. Um, right. Yes, I, I, I do think um, you you have to be the one that uh, directs us. We certainly are not pilots of vehicles. Or, so you... Uh, you must come along, and and I uh, hope you know what you're doing, and have. Oh, you certainly have a lot of confidence. So absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, have no fears on that score. Yeah, well, let's climb on board here. Go ahead and have yourselves a seat there. Uh, oh, well, I'm almost forgetting. I got to push this thing out of the boy. I almost just smashed right. Let's almost open that bag right in here. Let me uh, let me get this out and uh, come on, boy, get that horse up here. Pull this out. And the young native boy comes bringing in a dilapidated horse, but it's got just enough strength to pull this wagon out into the open air. And of course, it's uh, late afternoon by this time. And soon, soon you're gonna have such a beautiful view of the stars. Uh, either you ever you ever been to to Mars or Venus on a pleasure cruise, anything like that? No, not I. Well, no, I've, I've focused my anthropological uh, studies to the this planet. I'm afraid. 
Yes, well, in some ways, that dark continent of Africa is every bit as alien as Certus Major on Mars or Princess Christina Station on uh, Mercury. Well, I'm going to inflate the bags now. This hydrogen won't take us up high enough. This ether propeller doesn't work too well in an atmosphere. So, uh, here we go. I'm just going to hear a little hiss. I believe uh, you'll see the coffee service there in the back. Uh, if you'd like to help yourself, if you need something a little stronger, there's some fine liqueurs in the cabinet beneath. And this thing doesn't really look like, by the way, you know, it's not all chrome and sterile looking on the inside. It's got carpet in here, and there's a little bookshelf with reading material, little cabinets. It's very Victorian. And But you can see now out of the portholes, the, the ground falling away beneath you, and the little native boy waving. And you can see his observatory getting smaller and smaller. And it's not long before the blue outside the window starts to turn to purple and then black. And then Dr. Grant, or he's, he's not a doctor. Cyrus Grant says, all right, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. And then there's a big pop. And the bag pops. Yeah. And he thrusts the lever and there's a lurch as you guys just are slammed against your seats. And he goes, Yee-haw! he says, and you go tearing away from the earth and toward the moon. <clears throat> After a while, you get used to the acceleration, and he comes uh, crawling, in. and he, it's hard for him to get around in here, because this is not huge. Uh, you know, one thing that, I, that I did not occur to me, we will probably want to rig up some sort of a curtain system for my lady here. Uh, should she need to change or uh, some such thing at some point or relieve herself. Uh, so so that's one thing. I never think of these things because I've not been one to, uh, to be much in the company of ladies, but something to at least consider over the next six hours or so. Uh, the head's just back there if anyone needs it, but uh, like I say, it's up barely enough. It's not exactly a... Uh, it's not designed for the number two or for the sitting down. I say we should uh, be there in about six hours, so if you can hold it, you might want it. I will do my best to hold it. So, was the back supposed to pop? Absolutely. Yep, yep. Goes up as high as it can, pops, and that means we are ready to hit this ether governor. We have enough residual ether mix in the upper oxygen that we can take off from there. You wouldn't want to fly this thing in atmosphere. You'd have no control. Well, how are we supposed to get back? No. Don't worry about that. We got another bag. It's underneath. We'll just have to flip uh -huh. upside down. Very well. I it see. will be an awkward flip. I couldn't really engineer it otherwise, but uh, hanging upside down from the ceiling for a while, it's going to be nothing when you're coming back knowing you're going to be a rich man from all them diamonds on the moon. Possibly, possibly the discoverer of a moon man. Now that's, I think, quite absurd, but, well, I guess we shall see. Yeah, we shall see. And, uh, you know, if you've ever been on a long car trip, it's kind of exciting at first looking out the window, and it's exciting for a while just being your first time, you know, in the ether. And the stars are beautiful from up here. But after a while, like any long trip, it gets old until the time when you can see the moon where it's obviously big enough now to look like a real place instead of a, a disc in the sky. And as you get closer, you know, you can see the mountains of, and the, the convoluted lands around the edges of the craters, uh, but it does look barren. Well, look at her. Look at that stark beauty. I'm going to bring her in a little closer. Come in here and... Yeah, we're going to have to slow her down. Here we go. Slow her down. Nice. There we go. There we go. What I tell you? Listen to the precision. Boy, that little diamond back there is just worrying. There's only one problem, boy. If that thing goes, we are screwed because uh, I only I can only afford one of those big diamonds. You know? Well, well yes. can't we just replace it with one of the many diamonds you claim to be on? Exactly Ooh. my thought. That's exactly my hope. That's exactly my hope. But don't you worry. I just know there's, there's all kinds of diamonds up there. It may come to that, but let's not, let's not, there's no reason to believe we're going to have a crash or anything like that. So, I certainly hope not. I will, if 
fact, brace myself. Um, and, um, Mr. Uh, sorry, Dr. Riley, uh, if you would be so kind as to position yourself uh, in, a, in close proximity to me in case I swoon. <laughs> yes, of course, of course. Yeah, I was going to mention off. earlier that should you become frightened and swoon or faint, that I, I certainly will make an effort to catch you. We, we don't have a fainting couch, I'm afraid. Oh, yes, I, I see. I, I saw that that was missing, but I actually don't think um, I don't think I will faint. I think I've I've seen enough. I've been through enough in my life that um, I can handle whatever comes my way. I think actually the fainting might come from this damnable corsets that we have to wear. That's a damn good point. Damn good point. Now you can see we're uh, we're cruising at an altitude here of about a mile. You see that darkness up ahead. We're about to pass over on the dark side. You know, I've been studying this mysterious glow for about five years now. Collecting stories and we should be just on target for his exact position. And of course, it, uh, the, the ground before you still stretches out all jagged and gray. And At first, like I said, it did have a stark beauty, but nah, it just really looks like what it is, which is dead. And you pass over into the darkness, and he kicks on these big searchlights, two of them, that send these uh, shafts of light down below. And there she is. We're going to bring it in a little lower here. All right, all right, all right. Now there, there, there. You see in the distance that faint greenish tint in the darkness? That's got to be it. So he drops down to about 200 feet and he sweeps those searchlights. And finally, you come see the source of this, this greenish glow as it gets brighter and brighter. It's escaping from a really deep gorge. And it's, probably, it could be, it's about like 100 feet across probably. But it just cuts down into the moon as far as your eye can see. It just disappears into glow. Well, will you look at that? Quite stunning. Well, listen. Now, we came here at least in part <laughs> you know, to investigate this. It, it makes no sense to leave now. Uh, hey, these controls are working even better than I expected. What do you say we just descend? Just in the in the sh in the ether flyer. What do you say? See how far down we can get. You feel like doing a little climbing if we have to? I am prepared. And if you think it is wise to descend, think it's uh, safe, then I, I say yes. Let us uh, lower ourselves and see what is the source of this glow. Are we all in agreement on that, Dr. Riley? I think so. And should we need to climb out? I mean, at least the gravity is much less. Yes, it is about one-sixth of that of Earth. We should be able to do some fine gymnastics up here. But, uh, okay, I'm going to take her down in nice and careful. We're just going to very... How about a nice, cautious, about ten miles an hour? Yes, and I suppose that would be sufficient. Uh, certainly don't go any faster than you feel um, comfortable. At approximately what speed would you suspect that uh, hitting something might dis damage or destroy this craft? Well, that's a good question, but I think we're going to keep it nice and easy, 10 miles an hour. That way, if we have to, we can just set her down without without much more than a bump. It's all reinforced steel, of course. So you go down, and he's, he's dropping, and you can see, of course... He's about in the middle, safely in the very middle of this hundred foot wide chasm. And uh, the glow from below, you know, like I say, it just obscures a lot of what might you might be able to see below you. Uh, but you can, of course, see the cavern edges on either side and the portholes at the top. You can see the strip of uh, dark sky far above you. But You know what? What, what is this guy's name again? I'm sorry. Yeah, Cyrus I Grant. Cyrus Grant? Yeah. Okay. Mr. Grant, I had a thought. Oh, yes. Sure, please. Using my reason, reasoning and deduction skills, I believe this glow might be coming from the fungus that you spoke of You think earlier. so? 
Yes, I think uh, this is a form of bioluminescence. Bioluminescence. Well, see, now I'm not trained in the botanical arts. Well, being a lady, I have read up on plants of various kinds, I guess, and I suppose fungus is not a plant, but it's close to it. Its classification is neither animal nor plant. <clears throat> Elements of both. Hmm. Say, I wonder if fungi came from the moon in the first place. You ever think that? It just occurred to me just now. <laughs> well, that's quite a wild statement, but you could be correct. Now, while they're having that conversation, uh, they're kind of engaged in that conversation. Now, Archibald Riley, would you make an observation skill test, please? Uh, simple variety, I assume. Simple, yes. Yeah, so the aficionados know we're using the quick method of uh, testing and event resolution. And it sounds like I will then need a three or less, and I got a six. Well, you don't know what's going on, but you guys move on for you know, about 10 or 15 more minutes until, until it becomes obvious to all of you without a roll that the descent, the speed of the descent is gradually kind of increasing and you seem kind of slowly drifting towards one size and he seems to notice that just as soon as you do. Oh, wait a minute, this kind of snuck up and suddenly this thing isn't handling right. And he starts struggling with that control Suddenly, the whole flyer just lurches drunkenly away from that approaching gorge wall that it was starting to get to, but then it flies in the opposite direction and nearly hits the opposite wall. And he pulls it away just in time. Mr. But, Grant. Uh, hang on, whoa, this, I, I don't know what, something's interfering with the propeller's operation. It's, it's lowering it, it's official. <gasps> Wait, listen. Suddenly, you guys, there's this hissing sound coming from outside. Good God, do you know what that is? There's an atmosphere out there. That's, yes, gases, I believe. All right, we're, we're going to have to inflate the hydrogen bag here. Uh, and and uh, he lurches over for those controls. And when he hits them, the bag flips open and starts, you know, the whole thing flips over, right? So both of you uh, make dexterity rolls to avoid hurting yourself because it's the lower gas bag that he talked about earlier. He's, like, deploying it in an emergency just so he won't crash now that he's in an atmosphere. So it flips the whole craft over. So agility? Yeah, yeah agility. I'm sorry, I said dexterity. I meant agility. Oh, I succeed with the floor. That's good. And for these, for our attribute rolls, we just roll 1d6? Yeah, the quick method. There's another yes. method where you can roll them all and add them. We're using the quick method. And I rolled a 2. All right, well, both of, you, four. Yeah, both of you avoid t taking any actual wounds, but you get some bumps and bruises. And, uh, but no sooner... Uh, roll from here. And, uh, yeah, he also falls with a heavy thunk. Of course, he's a big thing to fall. But he uh, rolls a six, in fact. And he struggles back over to the controls. And just at that point, the bag snags on part of the wall of the, the gorgeous wall and it spins the whole thing around and you can hear all the gas escaping from the bag and you're tilted now and out the rear porthole above the ether propeller governor you can see the bag just dragging behind you ripped and not inflated the gas bag's ripped hold on I'm going to try to hit a ledge down here and break our fall otherwise we're goners and finally, the flyer just smashes into this ledge. And uh, all of you, again, make agility rolls, including him. He makes it pretty well. As you are thrown against one end of the cabin in a heap, along with all the little books and coffee service and, and uh, crates of food he has in here. How did you guys do? Anyone get hurt? No. I rolled a one. That's great. I'm glad you're both so agile. But, uh, everything finally comes to a sort of bone-jarring finality, and nothing is, uh, moving anymore. But 
some of the plates have popped off the rivets and fallen off the hull and there's actually like a breeze blowing through here now it's cool and damp but it's breathable and you also notice that the gravity is considerably higher than on the surface of the moon there it's like about one sixth that of earth but here it's it's not quite as much as Earth. It's maybe about a, a, a you know three sixths or four sixths that of Earth. You can still you can still tell. But anyway, the hull's severely damaged. Well, I, oh, I could repair this. It's repairable, but uh, oh no, oh no! And he runs what? down to the back and uh, he looks at the the ether propeller governor and that whole diamond that he had just shattered. The very thing that he was worried might happen has happened. Oh, well. Yes, I, I suppose now our hope of return is dashed. No, no, it's not dashed because, because we still have the spectrographic evidence of diamonds and we have our brains and I could repair that bag as well. So I say, let's. And you can tell he's struggling with putting a brave face on it. I think we let our famed explorer here take us down in search of some diamonds. That's what I say. What do you say, Dr. Riley? Well, I don't suppose we have a choice, have we? Well, that's why I've got you here. You're the expert. Don't worry, I got plenty of ropes and climbing equipment and uh, other sorts of survival gear ready. And uh, so I say we continue this descent and see what we can see. And uh, we, would you? And we'll of course keep our spirits up. Uh, would you mind taking the lead here and uh, and going out and uh, seeing if you can't figure out the best way down there, Doctor Riley? Yes, of course. Um, I, now. I don't suppose we're going to need these uh, breathing suits, as there does appear to be atmosphere here. Yes, it does. I say we save them and save the gas in case, uh, you know, we may need them on the way home. <laughs> Very good thinking. Yes, uh, I say we take our chances breathing in this foreign atmosphere. I suppose if it's good enough for fungi, it's good enough for us. Well, certainly implies a uh, an active life cycle of some sort. Yes, the the atmosphere does, and uh, maybe at the very least some sort of a uh, food. We got some food here, and we should take with it. But uh, hopefully, we won't have to look for those diamonds too long. Anyway, though, you get out and take a look around, uh, Doctor Riley, and you are on a ledge, and of course, you realize there's only one. There's plenty of other little ledges, um, but you think there's a, you're going to have to break out the ropes and repelling gear and uh, at least get down this this next big face but below that the next face that you could get to you could climb to with the rope you've got it's a couple hundred feet down but that is just blanketed with uh, with fungi and it's uh, kind of a yellow green fungus and that is indeed, you can tell now as you look over the ledge, uh, Henrietta was right. That is where this phosphorescent glow is coming from. Like individually, it would be really faint, but in the large amounts that are down there, it could very well be the ultimate source of that glow. I will say that the gorge walls here and the ledge that you're on, it's really damp and coated with like a slime, almost like a slimy mud so the climbing, you feel like, could be a little bit dangerous. But uh, the way this would work is you, um, Dr. Riley, would set up the ropes and everything and direct the climb down, and this would be uh, your wilderness travel role, just to set it all up nicely. Okay, wilderness travel. Need a five, and I get a three. Well, you're able to set up a safe system to repel down to the bottom. And so, even though it's a little scary, as long as the system is set up correctly, one needn't have a huge amount of skill to get down without too much trouble. And, however, Dr. Grant weighs so much that he has to roll, 
and he he gets down okay and finally you made it down to that level where the fungus is and do you guys want to like explore it a little pick it up break it open try to eat it uh, anything like that but the fungus yeah um yeah, I do want to at least observe it. I don't. I'm not going to be eating it. Um, you want to pick it up? <clears throat> no. Uh, I don't want to touch it. I just want to get a closer look at it. Okay. Well, you got a nice closer look at. I have it. a magnifying glass. Oh, you get so out your I'm magnifying glass. It. Okay. Okay. Well, with the magnifying glass. You can tell with the magnifying glass that these mushrooms seem to have like little pores, and there's a bit of a, a slimy residue leaking out of the pores. Hmm. What does it smell like? It smells. Um, it's got a. At first, it almost reminds you of like a nasty orange, like a rotten orange or something, also with an overpowering fungus smell, but it almost smells acidic. Doctor, what do you make of this? Uh, I'll hand him my uh, my magnifying glass. Uh, poss- possibly some sort of acidic compound. No, not you, mister. Oh, I yeah, said sorry. doctor. <laughs> sorry, I keep forgetting I'm not a doctor, being a famous inventor and all. Well, it does seem to be sort of secreting some sort of acid, perhaps. That's not certain, really. <clears throat> but I, I... Of course, having been uh, spent so much time in the wilderness, I've become quite accustomed to uh, investigating these types of things, so I think I would be quite comfortable to pick it up. Okay. Well, you pick it up. And I assume you We've never really specifically said you're wearing gloves, but when I picture, you know, a Victorian outfit and a gentleman, I do kind of picture gloves. But well, I, I, no, I mean, he wants to physically touch you, it. That's, okay, good. Get the whole well, tactile. you touch it and you pick it up, and you really your fingers start to sting a little bit, and you really it's it's because of the acidic quality of it, and you almost feel it, you know, just the way it. The way you hold it in your hands, the way it feels in your hands, it, it almost feels juicy. Like if you were to fall and land on, <laughs> you know, these mushrooms, or if you were to squeeze it, it might, you know, actually burn in your hand. Hmm, yes, quite interesting. So I do feel as though one were to, uh, let's say, fall upon a great field of these things, well, it could be quite painful and possibly injurious. Yes, I suppose that you could use this as some sort of uh, a weapon you could uh, throw at an enemy, as a, like a balloon what with, filled with acid. Yeah, possibly so, possibly so. Well, I suppose we better uh, keep on climbing. Uh, so, uh... Why don't you see what you can do and uh, get us down to the next level. Hey, hey, say, what's that down there? Y'all see that down there? You see some kind of silvery color down there? I mean, it was about 400 feet below us. There's so much fungus, but it stands out. Uh, both of you guys make observation rolls to see if you can see what he's talking about. Need a three. Ooh, nope, I got a five. You can't quite make it out. Um, so with our skills... Are we doing the, uh... Yep. We roll all of them? Nope, that's only in combat, where you roll all the dice. Oh, so only for skills, in you just roll the one die. Okay. When using the quick method, of course. Uh, I, go, I got right on my observation, which is five. Yeah, you can see exactly what he's talking about. There's a, like a bit of a metal or, or something down there. Well, that's gotta be worth the vesca. Hey, can't you, you see if you can't, uh... Can't, uh... Hook us up some more ropes and get us down this next face. We gotta check that out. Yes, of course. Yeah. Wilderness travel then. Oops, I dropped my die, but I have a backup. 
I got right on five. Oh, nice, nice. Well, you set them up great, but you realize while you're setting it up that everybody is going to have to be careful on the way down because at this point the fungus is kind of on the side walls too. And if you were to, you know, slip or place your footing wrong, you could kind of push up against them hard enough that it might squeeze out some acid. Um, so, if you don't have a wilderness travel skill to use doing this, then you should make agility rolls. And Dr. Grant made his. He got right on it. Just to make sure you don't kind of hit up against the side while you're climbing down. You said agility? Mm-hmm. I failed. Oh, no. Well, you swing out and if you can just land with your feet and push back, that's fine, because not enough acidic quality and I mean, you know, burn through your boots or anything, but when you turn out one side, you lose your balance a little bit and you kind of turn and it's your back that begins sliding towards uh, or swinging towards the wall and you hit it and bump with the top of your buttocks and your lower back and, well, I'm not rolling damage for that because it's one wound, but you can save in this game and it's going to cause you a wound of burn damage. Right now it stings real bad, but whether it burns through, I don't know. You're wearing the doublet, you got the bicycle suit, and so we'll just have to see. You roll a 1d6, and if you roll a 1 or a 2, then you save and you don't take the wound. No. No, no, well, ah, you take one wound. Oh, uh, stinging, burning, you got some blisters back there, nothing terrible, but uh, it's ah. definitely uncomfortable and unsightly well, fashion, fashion wise, because, you know, it's not like they all burned off, but, you know, they're, they're not shredded where flesh is showing, but it's obviously, you know, taking damage. Well, it's a good thing, the important thing is that you're okay, of course, and we can't stand Yes, I, uh, I hope that, uh, any moon men we meet will forgive my appearance. Well, well, let's hope we'll meet some now. Now, now Dr. Riley, your man yes. is not afraid of danger. Would you mind uh, look, going up ahead? See, now we can tell right up ahead. You see that chunk of metal there? Why don't you go first? Let's go check this out. Very well. Do you want to draw any weapons? Mm, let's see. Um, yeah, I mean, I might as well uh, pull out that... Uh, that revolver. Okay, okay. Got a nice Colt Army revolver, and you pull that out. Creeping forward. And there is indeed a, like a chunk of metal sticking up over the lip of this little edge. At this little uh, horizontal wedge, it's uh, on the sort of shelf of rock that you're walking on. And just as you look over the lip of that edge, you see a wrecked ether flyer. Its back is totally broken. Its hull is split open. And it's slightly larger than the one you came here in, but it's in much worse shape. It probably fell, you know, all this way. So its crash was a lot more violent. Do you want to go up and investigate it? Yeah. <clears throat> and in, and while, as I do so, I will be calling out. Hello? Is anybody here? Do you want to join him up there in the wreckage, Henrietta? Yes. And when you go up there, Grant kind of hovers in the background. And you can see, indeed, yeah, this is a ship. You guys, first thing you don't notice any bodies at all. But there are some other factors about this wreck which are slightly curious. But how much you notice is kind of up to observation rolls. Yes, well, I excel at this sort of thing, so let me see. I don't, but I did succeed as well, so... Yes, I succeeded. Well, you definitely feel like there's no bodies in here, but it's curious that a lot of the portions of the flyer that they seem to be missing um, and not ripped off, but actually taken off. Um... Most of the furnishings that you would expect are missing, and almost all of the electrical and mechanical equipment you would expect to find are gone, and the guts of most non-removable mechanical systems have been ripped out. And, uh, 
It appears as the as though this vehicle has been salvaged. Yes, scavenged, I was going to say, but yes. Well, yes, possibly scavenged, but it could be that the uh, occupant, uh, if it is this Russian man, could have possibly taken it out himself to try to repair it and build something else, maybe a ride home. So you think this was Tereshkova's ship? Yes. Well, uh, as far as I know, he was the only earthling to arrive here. Well, like I say, there were some early, there were some early experiments. Uh, uh, Jack Armstrong came here, Brian Masters, but uh, again, we can account for most of them. They never got this far. So yeah, I think you're right. It's got to be Tereshkova's ship. It's got to be. Is there any, uh, like, Strelik characters? Yeah, I was just about to, uh, just about to say, if you actually go out and look on the other, like, not the smashed innards of the ship on the outside, you do see some Cyrillic letters, uh, enough to, it's smashed and bent, but it's enough to, uh, well, I don't know if you can read, you can't read Russian, so you don't know the name of the ship, but yeah. Uh, Yeah, you know what, I think you're right. But what's this? What's this over here? And one of the things, you guys did notice this earlier with your previous observation rolls. It was just a little further away from the ship. And there are some boxes, some crates. And they're empty crates. One or two are smashed, but they're, it looks like there's six of them. And four of them are fine. They've actually been opened. But when you go over and take a look at them, and Dr. Riley probably figures this out for everybody else just from their sizes, but... There's a stenciled name on the side of the crates that says Remington. And these are crates, like, of rifles. But there are no rifles in them. Remington. It's perhaps oh. the Vladimir Watts' face has p- started some sort of arms trading program with the Moon Men. Yeah, so what could he be doing with... There must be, what, 30, 30 rifles? There was six crates... Five rifles a crate? That's what's he need with thirty rifles? He couldn't have even had half a dozen men and his whole crew. Telling perhaps that he chose American manufactured rifles and not Russian ones. Well, as Americans are all the best manufacturing, of course. But uh well well, fell I don't know. This is a mystery and it's a good thing I have you here. It's a good thing I have you here. But I tell you I'm feeling a little bit peaked after that. After that long climb, what do you say we just stay up here and get some rest and collect ourselves and figure out what comes next? I think you might be right. We've been on quite a journey. Yes, we have. Yes, we have. Well, it must be tea time somewhere. I brought this just for you. And he digs back and uh, into his pack and he pulls out a big thermos of tea. Oh, <clears throat> thank you so much. Oh, yes, oh, yes. So, sitting down and enjoying some tea on this ledge next to a crashed Russian ether flyer in the depths of the moon, we will leave you until our next episode of Space 1889. Nine. 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 Nine.